Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here with all of you and see so many old colleagues and old friends. Uh, I want to begin by thanking Felicia, uh, who really, I think, uh, set the stage for this uh, day, and Todd Tucker and everyone at the Roosevelt Institute for putting together such a fantastic program. I'm honored to be part of it. Uh, as uh, Felicia noted, I'm just a few weeks into my new role as senior advisor to President Biden for clean energy innovation and implementation. Doesn't fit on a business card, uh, but uh, I returned to, to the White House uh, to help work across the entire Biden-Harris administration to deliver on the transformational promise of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the single most ambitious legislative measure ever to accelerate building a clean energy economy and to combat climate change. I want to say that again. The single most ambitious legislative measure ever on clean energy and on climate. As you, and I've been here for four weeks, four weeks before that, we didn't think it was going to happen. So <laughs> we should applaud that too. Uh, as you know, I've been working on these issues for a very long time and for most of that time, saying the United States needed a national industrial strategy was not an idea that was taken very, very seriously by people inside or outside of government. Of course, over the last 40 years, with the exception of 93 and 94 and 2009, 2010, when we had uni unified democratic control of the White House and Congress, we did have a de facto industrial policy uh, and a de facto industrial strategy. And that strategy, if you can call it that, was the absence of a strategic, coherent national approach to investing in the innovation, in the supply chains, and in the infrastructure we needed to protect our national security and economic competitiveness. The result of that de facto industrial strategy over the last 44 plus decades uh, speaks for itself. Manufacturing jobs decimated and industries shipped overseas, often to countries that do not share our values, including to our commitment to protecting intellectual property, human rights, and ensuring decent jobs for workers. Industrial cities and suburbs forced to cut back on services as plants slash jobs and then close, depriving local governments of revenue and reducing demand from all sectors. Systematic underinvestment in our public infrastructure from roads and public transit to schools and water systems to newer technologies like broadband and 5G, uh, such that the physical backbone of our economy was becoming weaker over time. A determined campaign to undermine labor unions and take away workers' hard fought rights to organize and bargain collectively for better wages, benefits, and working conditions. A retreat from investing in higher education from registered apprenticeships to community colleges to state universities. Decades of rising income and wealth inequality, decades of the already privileged pulling further ahead while working families were left behind. Decades in which America's potential for sustainable economic growth and for building broad-based prosperity fell short of both where the economic fundamentals indicated they could be and where our values dictated they should be. This wasn't only bad for our economy, it was bad for our national security. Uh, because of the United States disinvested other countries, notably the People's Republic of China, but many others as well, moved assertively in the other direction. They built up world-class infrastructure, they invested in educating their young people, they made strategic bets to dominate the markets of emerging technologies, and over time, they began eating into America's competitive edge. President Biden and Vice President Harris came into office with a clear vision for changing the direction of the American economy with a modern American industrial strategy for investing in, Mer in American workers and strengthening critical labor protections, for reshoring supply chains that are critical to our national security and our economic uh, prosperity, for building up our infrastructure and industrial base so that America is positioned to lead industries of the future from semiconductors to digital technologies to clean energy, for creating truly equitable growth by investing in low-income communities and communities of color 
and communities that have borne the brunt of pollution for generations. And a vision for deepening our partnerships with countries that share our values, including our commitment to democracy, human rights, because America's alliance has made our country and our economy stronger. That started with the American Rescue Plan, as Felicia noted, which today's job report confirmed a job boom that has created 10 million new jobs just since the Biden-Harris uh, administration came into office. Over the last year, we've seen Congress and the administration work together to pass three landmark pieces of legislation that will have, help make President Biden's vision a reality. A once in a generation infrastructure bill in the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is now driving investment in everything from roads and bridges to hydrogen hubs and EV charging networks. A profound investment in strengthening the supply chain for semiconductors and making a down payment on next generation research and development through the Chips and Science Act, which passed on a strong bipartisan basis. And now the Inflation Reduction Act, which on its own will do more than any other piece of legislation in American history to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that are driving climate change. Together, these bills give the federal government an unprecedented set of tools to advance a modern American industrial strategy to strengthen our supply chains from everything from raw materials like critical minerals to consumer products like heat pumps and energy efficient appliances, to build a system that will help take innovations from lab to fab to markets across a huge range of industries, to use the incredible purchasing power of the federal government to stimulate demand for things like low carbon building materials that are made in America, to support ex expanded private investment in semiconductors and clean energy innovation and deployment in research and development, and do it all in a way that makes sure that jobs in the industries of the future are good paying union jobs that are tackling racial justice and environmental injustice head on and that communities in every corner of the country are seeing real world benefits. You're going to get a chance to hear from a lot of officials from the White House and across the administration. So I want to just use, take a few minutes of your time to focus on the IRA and what it will mean for building a clean energy economy. A few years ago, and probably some of you heard me do this, I might have detailed for you how climate change models predicted profound changes for every sector of our economy and every community in our country. Unfortunately, we no longer have to predict the future. We just have to turn on CNN. Climate change is fueling extreme weather events like hurricanes like uh, Ian to wildfires in the West to severe heat waves that are stressing our power grid. It is disrupting supply chains and causing shipping delays. It's making it harder for insurers to price individual policies and for reinsurers to evaluate market risk. It's reducing worker productivity, endangering public health, and even making it harder for children to learn. It's driving uncertainty for businesses of all sizes. It is increasing demands on government budgets at every level. It's wrecking havoc on our most precious public lands and waters. And as serious as all these issues are for the United States and for other countries uh, uh, with advanced uh, and diversified economies, climate change poses an even greater an eco economic and social challenge for developing economies who both face greater physical threats from the impacts of climate change and have fewer resources to cope. This dizzying array of challenges, fortunately, has a common solution. We need to build an economy that runs on the full range of clean energy technologies and in so doing dramatically cuts the greenhouse gas pollution that drives climate change. That is what the heart of the investments uh, in the IRA are all about, building a clean energy economy. The Inflation Reduction Act will go much of the way to putting the United States in a position to achieve President Biden's goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels by 2030 and having an electric uh, electricity sector free of carbon pollution by 2035. What that means in real world terms is that we need we need to and we are going to build a lot of clean energy clean transportation, clean buildings, and clean manufacturing over the next decade. 
hundreds of millions of more solar panels, tens of thousands more wind turbines, scores of grid scale battery plants for energy storage, miles upon miles of transmission infrastructure, including new interconnections to bring clean electricity to homes and businesses, a national network of charging infrastructure for electric vehicles, vast new networks to generate and move the clean hydrogen we need to power low carbon industry and a viable carbon capture and sequestration solution for hard to reach sectors, sectors and processes. A robust supply chain for developing, manufacturing and shipping low carbon materials to go into constructing, repairing and retrofitting our transportation infrastructure, homes, buildings and schools. The scale, scope and speed of the investments unlike, unlocked by the IRA will fundamentally reshape America's energy system. Thanks to the generous credit enhancements for paying prevailing wages and employing registered apprenticeships, developers will have strong incentives to put union labor to work in clean energy. Additional tax incentives will encourage investment in traditional fossil fuel communities and to repurpose fossil fuel assets. Rural communities will be able to access new and expanded loans, grants, and refinancing options for building clean energy and moving away from legacy infrastructure. And with $60 billion in resources for environmental justice, the Inflation Reduction Act will enable the most significant progress in our history to address the cumulative impacts of legacy pollution and create economic opportunity in frontline and fence line communities. That 60 billion will tie together with the president's commitment to Justice 40, which is transforming hundreds of federal programs with the goal of having 40% of overall benefits flow to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, underserved, and overburdened by pollution. So this is not only a climate law, it is not only an energy law, it is an industrial strategy law, and it's a justice law. All of this building I'm describing is going to take a lot of work. It will require work to coordinate not just between agencies in the federal government, but with state, local, and tribal governments, with local organizations, and with the private sector to make sure we're maximizing our climate and our economic impact. It'll require us to be creative about working with industry to bring co private capital to bear, not only on deploying proven technologies, but on accelerating the next generation of innovations. Sometimes it'll require us to pursue good enough solutions and to accept trade-offs that will help us move forward rather than holding out for the perfect answer to every challenge. We both have a challenge, you in the room and us in government. It's on us in government to make sure we have an energy infrastructure planning and permitting process that takes the views of affected communities seriously. But to get where we need to go on clean energy, it's incumbent on all of you to work with us to secure legislative changes that will help us build energy infrastructure smarter, faster, and more responsibly. Let me give you one example. When I was counselor to President Obama, I spent a fair amount of time working to unstick the permitting process for a transmission line in the American Southwest that would help bring more uh, clean energy to the grid. I thought we had succeeded. That was 2014. In my first week on the job working for President Biden, I went over to meet with Sen uh, Secretary Granholm and her team. And I was floored to find on our agenda included the need to unstick the permitting process for the very same transmission line we thought we had resolved eight years earlier. That is just crazy. We need to reform the way we permit energy infrastructure in this country, and we need to do it through legislation so that reforms are lasting and durable. The entirety of the Biden-Harris administration is committed to moving as quickly as possible to implement this historic law and all the policies underpinning the president's modern industrial strategy. In so doing, we'll be transparent, we'll be accountable, and we'll be laser focused on delivering results for families and communities. So today, I ask you all to commit to being our partners in this effort, to help us find solutions to the hard problems, 
to bring your energies, your creativity, your skills to bear on building the clean energy economy that America deserves. To drive a virtuous cycle of both technology and policy innovation that will benefit not only our country and our people, but people around the globe. I've never been so energized and so optimistic about America's ability to make the real promise of the clean energy future real as I am right now. And I hope you feel the same way. Thank you.